Hello, and welcome to the Artificial Podcast, with your host Nick Myers. Artificial Intelligence. Voice Recognition. Machine Learning. Robotic. Actionable Analytics. It is Nick's goal to help everyone understand how AI and voice technology are reshaping our lives both personally and within organizations. Your glimpse into the growing world of AI and voice first starts now. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Welcome to the Artificial Podcast. My name is Nick Myers, and I am here to help break down topics in emerging technology, artificial intelligence, and voice to help everyone understand how these technologies are impacting our lives both personally and within our organizations. The Artificial Podcast is brought to you by Red Fox AI. Red Fox AI helps give brands a voice by leveraging the power of AI and voice assistant technologies like Alexa and Google Assistant. If you or your organization is interested in sponsoring an episode, please send an email to the artificial podcast at redfox-ai.com. If you like what you hear, please feel free to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. You can also follow the artificial podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube by searching for the artificial podcast. Thank you for listening. And now on to this week's episode. Hey there, Artificial Podcasters. Welcome back to another week and another episode of the Artificial Podcast. My name is Nick Myers, and this week I am ecstatic to be joined on the podcast by John Stein. And if you are currently involved in the voice technology industry, you may have heard John's name floating around recently as he is working on a pretty amazing organization and association here for conversational AI and voice technology. And I'm really excited to be able to have a chat with him about that and just his breadth of experience. And I had the pleasure of meeting John actually at the Project Voice Conference back in January of this year. And I was just blown away by all the work that he's done. So I'm really excited to, to be able to bring him on the show for everybody. But before John and I start having our conversation, let me tell you a bit about John Stein. So John is currently leading the Open Voice Network, OVN, the nonprofit industry association dedicated to bringing the value of standards to the world of conversational AI to make voice worthy of user trust. His path to OVN coursed through the worlds of consumer goods, retail, and technology with global leadership roles at Intel and Cisco Systems. It was his second stint at Intel from 2014 to 2019 when this question was raised. What emerging technology will impact the relationship between a consumer-facing entity and its customers? His answer was voice. And I am so excited that was his answer because he has been such a value to this community. John, welcome to the Artificial Podcast. How are you? I'm fine, Nick. Thank you. And, and thanks for the opportunity and, and the very kind comments. Much appreciated. Absolutely. And, and I know we've been talking for a while now about doing an episode, so I'm really glad we're able to, to find the time, especially even amidst some of the things going on as we're recording in the world. And I'm, I'm really excited to get your perspective and for you to talk a bit about OVN. So I think it only is necessary for us to kick things off here. And I'm really interested, maybe you can start by talking a bit about you know, your journey from consumer goods to retail into technology and how all of those experiences now have culminated into your current work with the Open Voice Network. Well, Nick, it's been an, quite the journey and, you know, a long and strange trip, as some might say. I started in advertising and then went into into um, consumer goods, into actually the apparel industry, 7th Avenue, department stores, uh, women's apparel. And in that time, um, gosh, that was, you know, the 90s and up to the year 2000, I'm really beginning to understand that it's the consumer that drives everything. You know, a, a product can be created, uh, programs can be put in place, marketing can happen. But if the consumer, for whatever reason, for reasons of fashion, for reasons of channel, for reasons of interests, for reasons of discretionary income, if that consumer is not responding, or if consumer behavior begins to change, that sets in motion all kinds of changes. And entire industries get turned on their head as consumer behavior changes. And mm -hmm. that lesson then 
um, really was instructive for me as I began and then left the apparel industry and went to Intel and then to Cisco. And the task there, Nick, was, you know, I'm speaking about the value of technology in the commerce industry, retail and consumer goods. Speak and, and doing that and having the privilege of doing that worldwide. And so it's very easy in those conversations to get carried away. Here's the latest technology. Here's what's happening. Here's how you can do digital transformation or this or that or whatever else. And yet at the center of that, Nick, was always how and where is the consumer changing? Where and how is our consumer habits and behaviors mm -hmm. creating opportunities for technology and or just kind of shutting the door? on technology ideas that someone might see in a lab is marvelous and yet the day-to-day -day consumer says no so it's been a consumer-centric customer-centric journey for me and those lessons from way back in the day have um, been very instructive especially as now i've had the chance and the opportunity to enter the voice space learn about the voice space and meet you know great people like you that's that's a really fast no that's that's really fascinating I think that a majority of the different you know industries that you've been involved with have, have really always focused on the customer which I can only imagine as you kind of alluded to has just helped you so much more as you've come to start working in the the conversational AI and voice technology industry specifically because of course this technology is extremely customer centric and always will be. Um, and I personally think that probably gives you a, a huge leg up in all of this as well. I don't know if it gives me a leg up, but it's certainly, you know, it's what propelled me and with colleagues at MIT and Capgemini and, and colleagues at Intel. You know, we were asking the question, Nick, and, and you know, we're sitting in a coffee shop in Boston in 2016. <laughs> and, you know, instead of discussing the Red Sox, someone said, well, what do you think? You know, and you alluded to this, Nick, in the introduction. What do you think is going to be the technology that is goes going to most reshape the relationship between your every ordinary decision maker, you or me, and those entities, those for profit and non not for profit entities out there that that day to day individual interacts with on a regular basis? You know, it could be retailers, mm -hmm. it could be healthcare providers, it could be financial services companies. It could be the people who make their car. What's going to reshape that relationship most of all? You know, when you can have these kind of conversations and the lattes get served and you, you know, you can trot out the usual suspects. And you can imagine in 2016, what are the usual suspects? Well, IoT, right. AR, VR, you know, of course, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and the list goes on. And we began to look at each other and my gosh, this voice thing, this voice assistant, and not only the natural language, you're talking through a machine to the whole digital world, mm -hmm. but then this, you know, the amazing power of AI ML. And ultimately, my gosh, we looked at each other and said, Nick, gosh, where do you think this could go? You know, and <laughs> Love this, it. this is early days of Alexa, this is, you know, you're yeah. learning and, and it was like, my God, where could this go? And that led to a research paper with MIT that led to a number of other things. But it was that question, where might this go? And how might that reshape the relationship of the everyday consumer user, and those enterprise and those entities out there that you know, that we make our world from those relationships. And this could reshape it all. Uh, it was that moment. It was like, oh my goodness, this is something. Yeah, I love, I love that it was a discussion that took place in a coffee shop. I, I tell you, I feel like more amazing genius ideas and work have come out of coffee shops than we probably even realized this being one of them for you. <laughs> well, I, it was, it was certainly, it was a great moment. The latte happened to be good, by the way, but it was, it, you know, it's not a, I'm far from a genius, but it was one of these, oh my goodness, you know, and then you start to, and Nick, we all do this, but you start to envision the trend line. And 
you know, and you begin to do a little bit of research even in that day, and you could, can see where the developers and the innovators and the creators could envision taking this from the first notes of Siri into a future of personal assistance and, you mm -hmm. know, your voice concierge and all the things that the community can envision. And it's like, oh my goodness, look at the commercial implications. Right. Look at the legal implications. Look at the privacy implications. Look at all these things. Yeah, it was a very eye-opening, it began a series of very eye-opening moments. And those continue. That's fantastic. So based on all that, then what is one experience that stands out to you from any of your prior roles? Um, you know, what was that experience and what impact did it have on your career and the work that you ultimately are now doing in, in technology and voice? You know, I think one of the things that really was impactful for me, Nick, um, and again, I have a few miles on my odometer, so there's a, there's a <laughs> you know, a bit of experience here, I think is seeing the, and I'll use this phrase, and this was uh, involved with other technologies rolled out um, over time is is how does an industry close what I would call the trust gap? And the trust gap I would I would suggest is the gap between availability and adoption, mm -hmm. and the maturity of adoption against availability. You take a look at just the rollout of the internet and commerce. I mean, in my, one of my first assignments at Intel, when I came on board in 2000, now think of where the internet was and internet yeah. commerce. E-commerce was in 2000. One of my first assignments was, John, we need your quote unquote expert advice to tell us if you think women will ever use the internet to shop. <laughs> well, awesome. and it, you know, and, and we can, and Nick, very appropriately, we laugh at that question yeah. today, but there was a trust gap. You right. know, someone's gonna steal my credit card or someone's going to hack in, or this is not safe. There was a trust gap and that gap was closed. And I mean, the heaven's sakes, and especially now during the pandemic, um, e-commerce is accelerating at even a faster clip than ever before. But there indeed was that question. Um, a question I was involved in a peripheral way with the rollout and the standards development of RFID. And really? the use of that across industries. And again, there was a trust gap. Right. Well, the technology can, can do this, but do we trust it to do that? Is it reliable? Is it dependable? Is, you know, can it be hacked? Is it secure? You know, are we gonna be taken advantage of by suppliers? Are the suppliers reliable, dependable? Because they're startups, you know, and those startups, they may be here today and gone tomorrow. So the trust gap had to be closed. And that happens, and it happened with RFID in, in a couple of ways. One, it just takes time for an ecosystem to form and, and to solidify and mature. And second, in that case, there was the development of standards, which, okay, this is how it's going to work. Here are the governance processes. We're going to agree on how these things interoperate. And that began to close the trust gap. Now, and RFID very quietly now over the past many years is a standard, it's a technology that we take for granted. Right. It's out there, you know, and it has met many of the projections that were being asserted and sometimes, you know, with questions in 2002, 2003. So again, the trust gap is formed. That trust gap, I think, is one of the issues before us in voice. Absolutely. A tremendous opportunity, as we all know, a tremendous potential. And yet it's, you know, and some people would point to a trust in terms of data use and data mm -hmm. protection. Well, you know, of course, that's a standard thing with a, with a new technology, Nick. But it's, there's also the trust of, do I know how to use it? Am right. I going to feel stupid? because I'm not quite sure how this is. Can I trust that I'm gonna be connected to the credible source that I'm seeking? 
Mm-hmm. Will I trust this? Will I trust that? So, you know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm rattling on here. But no, I, I think you're making insanely cl- important points here. It's closing the trust gap, I think, is one of the many things before us here in, in the voice industry. And and from the experience with RFID, from you know seeing how standards development helped the internet, um, a group of us were looking at each other on campus in Cambridge several years ago and said, you know, gosh, this this industry might be kind of like the internet was in ninety three, ninety four, ninety five with the browser mm. wars. Yep. You know, and it's and can. Are there things we can do, Nick? And that was the question. Are there things we could do to help fully, number one, close the trust gap or begin to narrow it? Never will be closed completely, but narrow it substantially and then to unlock this incredible value. What things could we, can we do? What part can we play? And so from that came the Open Voice Network. No, that's, I think every single point you made there is, is is critical to this whole thing and i think it's fascinating that in, in a lot of your prior roles you've, you've continuously been working on on closing those those trust gaps with so many different pieces of technology and i i think the example you threw about rfid was was so applicable to this whole thing because i i i somewhat remember when that first was coming out um and I, I remember just headlines all the time about, oh, RFID, people are going to be able to steal your credit card information just from having something in your wallet and, and, and all, this, all this crazy stuff. But now RFID is in so many different pieces of technology because that gap has been closed. And, you know, we apply that same, that same concept to voice assistant technology. And I would say the, the trust gap, as we know here, is definitely a, a chasm to cross. But that's what also makes it fascinating and exciting and there are so many different opportunities right now because of that and to throw Without some different question. yep throw some different items into that to help close that chasm or at least make it narrower so i i think every single point you made is is spot on and it'll be interesting to see over the next couple of years through the work that OVN is doing and i think just as the industry progresses even post pandemic how that gap is going to evolve all in itself it's going to be very interesting and i think you know i've mentioned and, and we've talked here nick in this in, in the call here about the open voice network dedicated to bringing standards and indeed that's our primary charter but within that trust gap there are several other things nick and i think it's worth mentioning the one of them is just the value propositions of voice to the individual mm-hmm. vertical industries where do you use voice? Because the technology is one thing, but the use is something else. Right. And so being able to develop, and it's one of the things we're exploring, can we be partnering with you know, industry consultants or industry advisors in, in taking a look at quantified value cases the use of IVR, the use of voice assistant, where is that a value? How does that create quantifiable value? And indeed a question, Nick, for all of us in voice is, yes, voice can do this, this, and this, but is it better and a, a, a better investment than the other things that have been doing that? You know, it's not just voice, it's voice as an alternative to mm-hmm. something else. Right. And so taking a look at the use cases and the value propositions, I think that's part of the trust gap. Also would say and suggest that just ethical use frameworks, mm-hmm. ethical use guidelines, part of that, especially for the enterprises. You're de- we're, you know, I mean, as we all know, we're dealing with biomarker biometrics, yep. right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, how do you use that? What should your guidelines be for data usage, data storage, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, right. And we need to have, as an industry, you know, very carefully, communally developed guidance as to what is good, what's the best practice, yes. what should we as a society pursue in that way. All right. these things can come together within that trust gap area. Yes. Well, and, and as we know too, you know, of course, Amazon and Google and Samsung and even Microsoft have. Have done incredible work with this technology, and if it wasn't for 
for their investment in this. I, I truly don't think we'd be where we're at now with it. But at oh, the without, same time, without question. these companies have no incentive to develop guidelines or standards, right? Because as amazing as their technology is, and this is just, you know, the nature of, of corporations and nature of business is you are always trying to leverage the things that you create to, you know, make more money and, and do things like that. So, you know, the technology we have with, with what they've created is incredible, but they're in no hurry to do standards, which is why I think the work that OVN is doing is even more important because the longer that, you know, guidance or any type of standards are not issued in this, the more opportunity there is for nefarious actors to come in and, I don't want to say, of course, ruin this for everybody, but make it definitely more challenging. So that's that's why I truly believe in, in all the work you're doing with this. And I'm so glad that oh. these questions have been raised. Well, Nick, thank you. And and yeah, I think there is. And, and obviously I'm biased, but there's a place for a neutral nonprofit. Yes. That is, you know, and we want all boats to rise. I mean, all we, you know, you take a look at the work of Adam Chire at Samsung and, and of course the leadership at, at Google and Amazon and others. And all you can do is applaud. I mean, just right. brilliant, groundbreaking work. But, you know, there's a role for a neutral, objective community bringing us all together type party. And that's what we were trying to do. That's what we want to do. And to lift all boats, level the playing yes. field for all. And ultimately, Nick, I think, you know, the value of standards is standards expand markets and they consistently yes. have done that. And we want this to grow for all. And standards can be a piece of that, I think. Yes, absolutely. A hundred percent. So with all that in mind, what stands out to you? I know we've, we've talked a lot about, about voice and, and a lot of things, even just so far, but what stands out to you as being the most fascinating aspect of this technology and conversational AI and, and overall, how do you think it's going to evolve over the next couple of years? Uh, and Nick, I respond to this I, I'm, and everyone knows who, who's met me here. I'm not a developer. And so, you know, I don't have a good technical response to that. I'll come at it from a consumer behavior. One of the things that fascinated me at the start of, you know, back in the coffee shop in 2016, all the way to today is it is so easy to say yes you know it voice makes it potentially so easy to say yes um over the past several years have done as a as a absolutely amateur researcher nick have been trying to study um behavioral science the science of decision making you know, the Daniel Kahneman type work and seeing how decisions can be shaped and nudged and, and mm -hmm. helped along the way. And to realize that so many of the small barriers and cognitive hurdles that are in front of decision making begin to melt away when you have the easy ability to say yes or to say no. Right. Or simply to ease that process. And so just fascinated by what voice can do in the realm of commerce, in the realm of potentially in connected cities. How does it, how can it engage citizens? Where does it fit in? And, and you know, people like Terry Fisher and others are leading us how to understand where this can fit into healthcare and life sciences, you know, in diagnosis and early detection and all yeah. kinds of things. You know, it, it's just, oh my goodness, but the ease with which that individual can now connect, can now learn, can now converse as the technology expands. And then as we get into contextual type dialogue, you know, this is going to be absolutely remarkable on how it changes and makes it again back to it makes it easy to say yes. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and actually, as I'm kind of digesting what you just said there, it, it's leading me, I, I want your perspective on this because this is something that I've been thinking about for a while now, especially with your background in, in retail too. So do you think, because I've been thinking about this, do you think that maybe we've reached a point with consumers that there is almost too many options and we're almost starting to face a 
decision fatigue, if you will. And, and I've been thinking about this because as, as you're mentioning the ability to just say yes or no with technology and voice, I'm almost wondering, you know, do you, first of all, do you think we're facing a decision fatigue as consumers? And do you think voice can help simplify that process to make it more efficient just all across the board in that respect? I'm really curious. I, I want to know what your thoughts are on that. To your first question, are we facing decision fatigue? Absolutely. And the research across consumer goods and retail would indicate that oftentimes when assortments are narrowed, then conversion goes up. I'm, I live very close to an A-plus Kroger store, and it's mm -hmm. a marvelous, beautiful store, and I love Kroger. They're, they're great retailers. But I face, what, 17, 18, 20 different options for olive oil? <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I mean... I, I, I love to cook. I enjoy cooking, but I can't tell you how I would choose between 17 yeah. to 18 options of olive oil, you know? So, you know, in those situations, you know, what happens is that people choose fancy labels or choose the lowest price. Right. But decision fatigue, you know, after a while, the cognitive stress level, I'm standing in front of the olive oil assortment and the cognitive stress level goes up. Which olive oil am I going to choose? You know, are my neighbors, once they can visit our home again, are they going to laugh at my <laughs> olive oil choice? You know, <laughs> I love this example so much. But, you know, so yes, we are facing decision fatigue. Um, and it's very clear. It's one of the reasons I think that, you know, a Lidl and an Aldi are doing so well. They make it simple. They make it easy to say yes. And indeed, voice with the combination of voice and ultimately the personal assistant AI that we can all envision can begin to provide not 18 choices, but two to three, mm -hmm. even narrow down and curate, you know, the term curation yeah. often it's becoming a cliche, you know, everything's curated these days, but curation, the merchandising, the choosing of best options, you know, ultimately, that's the value proposition of retailers. They bring in, they curate and merchandise and give you the options to choose. And now with the opportunity for me to be voice connected to my personal decision assistant, who can, based upon preferences, based upon interests, based upon any, you know, the thousands of things, the data variables that could become into play, can help me narrow extraordinarily valuable extraordinarily valuable i i love i love your your response to that and specifically the olive oil example because i think you know if we look outside of of something as simple as olive oil it, it's everywhere i was actually just having a conversation with a friend in australia a couple of days ago and i'm like i am now because i'm home so much when i do get some more free time of myself i i go through netflix i go through hulu i go through disney plus but there's so much content and so many decisions to make. Half the time, I just turn it off and go do something else. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, yeah. Yeah. The behavioral scientists would say you reached your point of cognitive stress and it's just forget it. Yeah. You know, my brain can't handle it. And voice can be, to your great point, Nick, voice can be a means and a method through which the cognitive stress is reduced. And in fact, those brands and those, you know, those entities that help you reduce the cognitive stress and voice will be a tool to do that are going to be the ones who will win your loyalty long term. Absolutely. I, and I know there, there's been, I would say not maybe concern, but there's definitely been some discussion I've been hearing lately of, well, you know, brands for so long have been used to just mass marketing, even in the age of digital and social media, we had to narrow that down more. But now with a technology like voice, you only get, you know, one, two or three shots to get in front of your customer. So I, I think you're spot on with your, with your analysis there of it, it is going to get more and more important for brands to truly focus on who their audience is with this technology and specifically how they're going to get picked up with it. I think that's one of the, the huge opportunities associated with this as well. So I, I really love your, your analysis of, of that question there. I'm, I'm actually really happy we're on the same page too, because I've, I've just been thinking about this and I'm like, who could I ask that would give a really insightful answer? I was like, John Stein with all his years in retail and tech. Well, <laughs> don't know about that, Nick, but I will add this also is that voice and with 
AI ML with the breadth of data now available about shoppers. And if we get over the consent hurdle, um, but one of the things about voice is that it can expand by millions of degrees the ability to move from a transactional relationship with a consumer, a shopper, a patient, mm -hmm. whoever that is, into an interactional, an yes. interactive, interactional back and forth. You know, entities, enterprises, retailers, use them as an example, are used to talking to their customers all the time. Here's an ad, here's a promotion, here's a coupon, here's a this, here's a that. Very few of them are experienced in listening. And now if we get into an interactive mode, not just with one, but thanks to AI ML voice with millions. Yes. Now we have, in a sense, a real life, real time focus group that we can listen to. Yeah, it's, it gives yeah. me chills because that's so cool. It's incredible. <laughs> and, and we can, and now the ability, because, you know, we talk about voice, voice suggests to so many of us it's talking. But to, for the enterprise community, I think it represents an extraordinary opportunity as it moves from transactional to interactional, interactive, dialogue-based, even command and control right now, it's a tremendous opportunity to listen. And mm -hmm. those who listen are always the better in sales. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the... I, we've even been looking more into, I, of course, I know everything associated with the data, but the, the, the type of data that you can get oh, from, my gosh. from somebody using a voice assistant versus any other medium is just, it's, it's astounding. And then you throw but, in yeah. some different technologies that can interpret the contextual, the emotional intent and understanding of, of maybe you're asking for a specific product or you're asking for a specific service or you're, you know, it's, it's going to lead brands to, to so much success if they listen to it. I think that's an if, excellent point. If, if, yes. if, they, if, if they choose to listen to it, but Nick, you just brought up a point. Let's, and let's assume for a moment we've anonymized data and we're protecting consumer privacy, but simply to know in a response to a question or in a query, how many of my shoppers, again, using retail as an example, are hesitant in their response? Oh my goodness, that tells you a whole lot more than whether mm -hmm. they said yes or no, you know. So anyway, it is an extraordinary repository of data. We have just begun to think and figure out how that might be used. We, and to my understanding, we've just begun to think, Nick, to an earlier point about the ethical use of it. How do we, you know, what are the right things to do? How do we protect privacy? You know, exclude bias, all these things. But yeah, it's in front of us. Yes, it's, it's so fascinating. And like, like I said, some of the things you're just talking about be, because of that wide access to, to more of this and interpretive and emotional data just, just gives me chills. It's so exciting. So switching gears now a bit, I know we've, we talked early on in our conversation a bit about the Open Voice Network, but I think it's important maybe if you could dive into briefly the story of how the Open Voice Network came to be. And truthfully, you know, we talked about standards and guidance, but what are some of the other core goals that you're trying to accomplish with OVN and anybody who's a part of this association is, is trying to accomplish essentially for, for the industry. Um, I'll try and be very concise on the story. We, um, you know, it started in the coffee shop, led to a research paper, made some presentations, found ourselves in front of a CEO of a tier one enterprise in the States. And um, at the end of that conversation, the CEO said, this is going to take standards, won't it? Yes, sir. This may take, may take some legislation regulation, might it? Said possibly, sir. And that CEO looked at us and looked at me and said, who's going to do this? That led to some, you know, some seed money investments that led to, can we, could we do this? Mm -hmm. And really starting, Nick, about 15 months ago, began reaching out what do you think of this idea? What might be possible? Could we do this? If we did this, where might we focus? 
And it's led to, again, an affiliation with the Linux Foundation, how the organization I expect will be legally stood up here in just a handful of weeks. And with three major remits or, or uh, charters to pursue. The first is the development and proposal of standards. Uh, we don't expect to be a standards body, but proposing standards developed communally, developed with geographic diversity, um, proposed to global standards bodies. Is that W3C, IEEE? I just don't know. Mm -hmm. But um, to propose those. The second one is to help raise the awareness of enterprise value of voice. Where does this create quantifiable, replicable value? How does this impact the PL? How does this impact consumer loyalty? Where is this going to happen? And then to also just raise the value of, and raise, I should say, raise the voice into a chorus of here's the potential of voice and here's how it can increase exponentially through the closing of the trust gap, through standards, through any number of things, but to be, you know, raise our voice in the community. And the third, Nick, would be, and we've had some discussions in Washington and in Brussels, and we'll continue those, but questions, you know, it's just playing a role in advocacy. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not going to be a lobbying body for God's sakes, but there are questions about data privacy, questions about consumer, about use of voice data. How can we be and represent the industry from a communally developed perspective? And I underscore that to be providing the right advice to those who are asking questions of a neutral body as right. we are, you know, and we're, we find ourselves in that role. So, those are the three major areas, and probably 65% of the time will be spent on the standards development. Um, but then the other 35% between uh, raising awareness, raising our voice, and then some advocacy policy advice work. Yeah, and all, all three of those are, are, are critical, I think, to the long-term evolution of this industry. And I love how you opened it up with you, you, you had a meeting with the CEO of a tier one enterprise company. And... And he started asking these questions and, well, who's going to do it? <laughs> yeah, well, it was, here we are. Here we are. Here we are. You know, who's going to do it? Are you going to do it, John? And, you know, that was the question directly applied to me, which led me to turn to my wife and say, well, well let's go for it. Yeah. No, that's that's a really cool story. I remember you, you telling that in uh, Tennessee and I was just kind of blown away, especially with this only really getting going here in the last 15 months, the amount of work that that's just been done even get to this point, I'm, I'm still blown away by, but all of the goals that I think this organization is trying to accomplish are, are really going to set the stage for the success, the success of voice and conversational AI for years to come, you know, and I, again, I think it's crucial that this is a nonpartisan neutral body that is doing this as well because again you know as we kind of talked about earlier the tech companies who have created this amazing technology as brilliant as they are they have no incentive to do this and of course government is focused on a million and one different things especially right now so i think the only real way to accomplish these goals that need to be accomplished and, and set this groundwork for the industry has to come from a body like this. And I, I, I personally couldn't be more grateful of all the work you've done and I'm super excited to be a part of it. So, Thank you. And if you're anyone listening, if, if you're working in the voice technology space and are interested in learning more about Open Voice Network, you know, reach out to John or likewise, they, they have a website and, and there's more conversation happening just amongst everybody in the community. So there are definitely ways I'm sure people can get involved as well, right, John? Absolutely. And we take a look at us at www.openvoicenetwork.org. Um, reach out to me on LinkedIn. It's a funny spelling of the name, J-O-N-S-T-I-N-E, John Stein on LinkedIn. And But we're looking to bring people into the communities, the community of Open Voice Network. And we respect, you know, everyone has their day job, but if we can all lift a bit of a, of, of a voice here and come together as a group, we can advance this and advance in the ways we need. So Nick, thank you. Yes, absolutely. 
So do you envision over the long term, I know, of course, everything is still getting up and running, but do you think OVN will remain primarily as a standards only body? Or do you envision the organization having a much larger role to play moving forward? Oh, gosh, um, great question. And I, I just I don't I don't know. It, it's a it's a great question. I think the the first challenge of open voice is to bring results to the community and that will be primarily and first in the realm of standards development and the conversations that lead to standards development if there is a need for a neutral uh, body you know i mean bradley metrock and uh, speaking of another person who's done just marvelous work mm -hmm, absolutely you know, bradley started the you know the voice first community and and we've adopted some of the voice first efforts under the banner of open voice and bradley's request and invitation you know can we continue that should that can that be continued i think there's a place for it um and so yeah nick will have to find out what we'll to see and that's what I think um, you know. makes this exciting too is the possibilities are, are are kind of endless for how this can evolve in the future. I think once you know the initial work of of setting standards and getting those out there um, into the industry, I think is done. So I'm I'm really excited to see how how this evolves. So oh, and thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And so quickly changing gears one one more time here to some some other things I'm really interested in discussing. What do you think one key advantage is for organizations, brands who either already have or who are thinking about deploying voice assistant technology within their organization or to to solve a problem with their customers? I think the the approach needs to be taking your second question and rephrasing it. This is about ultimately, this is about customer connection, patient connection a client connection this is about a driver being connected with an autonomous vehicle what are the ways in which you can enhance increase better faster cheaper smarter that connection between that individual and your business now that won't be by voice alone that will be voice mm -hmm. with a lot of other things that will be no doubt multimodal, but how do you, how do we, and we start with that question, not the question of what technology is coolest. That's the second or third or fourth question. <laughs> the first question is how do we connect? Because this is about connection right. and information sharing and persuasion. This is about dialogue, this is about interaction. Where and how should we do that? then come technology questions and then how that is brought together. But I think it starts with that. And um, I'm, as I've said in this, in this conversation, Nick, um, I'm, a, I'm a complete bigot about being consumer, user, customer, patient centric. Yes. Start with that individual, start with her, start with him, start with they, and then as their needs are, are identified, as those needs are revealed, as those needs are understood, then it you build from there. I think that is an excellent answer to that question. And I think, especially now in the midst of, of as we're recording this, the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, more organizations who maybe have not been so customer centric it appears are quickly changing their tune as as they should be. And I think those that are more agile and able to switch their thinking to that customer centricity, like we see many other companies who have and how successful they've been, well, considering this technology at the same time, I think are going to be extremely well off over the next couple of months as we kind of exit this, this crisis the world is in, which leads me into a, a, another question, of course, I have is how do you view the COVID-19 pandemic affecting conversational AI or the voice industry, and what outcomes do you think there'll be with this technology in the post-pandemic world? First of all, it needs to be said very clearly, this is a tragedy and a frightening time. Right. And yes. so, you know, I've heard people say there are silver linings in this. The deaths of 
thousands, there are no silver linings in that. Correct. There are, however, Nick, and I think that, you know, reading Professor Scott Galloway's blog, and I think he expressed it very well, this will accelerate trends already in motion. If it was moving at 2x, it's going to be moving now at 6x or 8x. Yes. And it will advance into a next chapter much more rapidly and with greater impact. So not only will it go faster, it'll get larger. And remote communication and connection, of which voice assistance is a huge part, is going to be a beneficiary of that. I firmly believe, and I'm beginning to see some data as well as anecdotes that that is indeed the case. Mm -hmm. You see it, you know, Terry Fisher's recent webcast about, you know, how voice is being used amidst the pandemic, blogs from China coming in, how it's being used in the pandemic to connect, to communicate, to share information, to diagnose. None of that would have been thought of four months ago. No. You know, back in December, it wasn't even on anyone's list, Nick, right? I mean, nope. All, all forced and accelerated ahead. So now we have new paradigms, new models of, of, and it's not how voice is being used. It's new models of how humans connect and connect effectively and efficiently. And voice is at the center of that. It'll be one of the tools, but, you know, as we have, and Nick, as you know, we have a, a voice first community group that is working in education. Well, voice assistance now, how do you teach remotely? How can you teach multiple students remotely? How do you provide personalized education remotely? Mm -hmm. Voice assistance is one of those tools. And so again, I think it's, this is going to be in probably three areas, Nick. Um, Number one in just, let's call it connection and service. We, at this point, whether it's in medicine or something else, we need trustworthy, credible answers. Yes. And IVR, you know, voice chat, whatever it can be, the ability to provide knowledge and to be using voice technologies to do that, provide trustworthy, credible knowledge, that's going to be one area where that's not going to go backwards. No. A, a second is going to be in just digital commerce, voice-enabled digital commerce. You take this trend of digital commerce, then you intersect that with the membership subscription programs like a Walmart Plus or a Prime. Yep. I mean, this is, you, you know, now you put voice in the middle of that to make it easy and you're just, you're putting rocket fuel in a match together. Yes. That's going to happen, you know. And then the third thing is just the whole hands-free operations. Huge one you know? there. Huge, huge. Yes, I would rather talk to my elevator than touch a grimy button. Yes. yes. <laughs> you know, you and I, you know, and you and I and hundreds of millions would rather talk to a, talk to a screen, talk to a button, talk to something else than to reach our fingers out. So I think in those three areas, you know, service, digital commerce, and hands-free operation, this will be advanced. Yes, I think those are three very, very, very huge areas that I think are going, well, they're already being affected by this technology that are only going to be affected more. And I think it was a couple weeks ago, you shared that one LinkedIn article where they talked about the voice enabled elevator. And I was like, we've needed this for years. I, I, I would use this like right away if that was deployed, you know, and I'm Absolutely. I'm actually quite shocked that it hasn't been deployed in, in, in more I guess anywhere where elevators are used, which are buildings, apartment buildings, just so many different use cases for that. So I, I think you're spot on with with some of the different areas that are going to be affected by this technology in, in the post-pandemic world. I'm, it'll be very interesting, I think. But um, I love Scott Galloway as well. So I, I think I read the same thing where he's like, anything that was moving at 2x is going to be moving at 8, 10, 15, 20 exactly. from here on out. Exactly, exactly. Fantastic. Well, as we kind of wind things down from our amazing conversation here, I always like to end on this question. What is one thing that you think someone can do today to begin leveraging voice assistant technology, either personally or within their organization? I would look at 
the need to connect easily and simply with consumers. Now that's, you know, of course, you know, that's not a strategic breakthrough to say that. But I would look at where you can be engaging for the first time in more than a transactional relationship with your consumer, your patient, your client, whoever that is, where they can gain from advice, where they can gain from information, and where you can begin to automate that. And so it becomes easy to reach out and connect with you. I'd be looking at that. And I'd be looking at ways in which the ease of connection can be merged and where the ease of connection can be better than where it's been before. Again, this is potentially less about talking and much more about listening. Mm -hmm. the, the, in, the interactivity, again, from transaction to interaction, the interactivity is of huge potential benefit where can I create that interactivity while providing things of value to my consumer? This, that interactivity and that listening opportunity is what makes this remarkably unique mm -hmm. and different from other means of communication and connection with a customer. That's where I'd be, that's where I'd be looking. And that leads then to all kinds of the thousands of questions, Nick, as you and I both know, of things about brand tone and personality, right. blah, 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 you know, on and on. Yeah, I the this is more. I, I'm I'm still hanging on to that that line you said where this is more. This is more about listening than it is talking. I think that line alone. It just if, if you're listening to this right now, just let that sink in and digest what John just said there, because I think that is a foundational piece to all of this. And you're actually the first person I've heard say that. And I think that that is is truly something to think about because the opportunity to listen, really listen for the first time to your customers and to people using this technology in a way unlike anything they've ever had before, I think is, is so game changing. I'm, I'm that, that's what I'm hanging on from that. I, I really appreciate you said that line. I'm going to hang on to that one. <laughs> you may see me tweet that out later. <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. Well, John, this has been an amazing discussion. I, I can't thank you enough for, for taking the time to, to chat with me and, and share all your insight and, and knowledge with everything that you're working on with the listeners of, of the Artificial Podcast. And I know you mentioned a couple of different ways already to get in touch with you, but if there's any other ways that you think uh, would, would help folks if they wanted to contact you or get involved with the Open Voice Network, what are some of the different ways they can go about doing that? Um, start with the website, www.openvoicenetwork.org, Open Voice Network, all one word, um, or on LinkedIn, John, J-O-N, Stein, S-T-I-N-E. Um, we're looking for volunteers, we're looking for leaders, we're looking for people who believe in a standards-based future that's multi-platform, multimodal, multi-use, multi-device. And if you see that future too, please join us. Yes, and I'll, I'll completely echo what John just said there. I've, I've been involved about the past two months and it is one of the best decisions I've made. I've been able to, to meet so many people and it's just knowing that you're working on something that is, is going to affect an entire industry. There's, there's just nothing else like that. So definitely get involved if you're working in the voice space and, and really want to make some effective change. Well, John, thank you so much again for, for taking the time thank to chat you. with me and I know we'll be in touch soon. Thank you so much. Best wishes, everyone. Artificial intelligence, voice recognition, machine learning, robot. You've been listening to the Artificial Podcast with your host, Nick Myers. Nick Myers. To stay up to date with all our latest episodes, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts. To learn more about how your organization can benefit by unlocking the power of AI and voice, visit www.redfox-ai.com. Until next time.